and to the Ukraine conflict now and a group of people who answered a call for help from the Ukrainian president Volodymyr Zelensky to join the fight against Russia's invasion. The International Legion includes soldiers from many countries who have fought and died alongside Ukrainians. DW's Matthias Berlinger visited some of the International Legion fighters who had just come back from the front. Target practice. Keeping skills sharp while away from the front line. Rest, resupply and a bit of relaxation. The International Legion has been part of the Ukrainian army since the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion. We are just a simple unit, normal unit, just some foreigners and uh, work together with the Ukrainians. Max Eberhard had two years experience in the German army. He came to Ukraine just weeks after the war started. And I uh, never thought there would be a war in Europe again, so... Um, and I didn't really have better things to do back home, like, a, let's say, a boring job. I wanted to help people and uh, Zelensky asked, so I came here. Three days into the war, the Ukrainian president called for friends of peace and democracy to help defend his country. It was a message that hit home for Finnish volunteer call sign Hobbit. It's, it kind of stuck with me that uh, Europe didn't do enough. And uh, um, I remember when we had the war, we got volunteers. So I was like, well, at least I can do that. So. Hobbit was referring to the Finno-Soviet war of the 1930s. Many here bring their nation's historical experience with them. Volunteers from more than 60 countries have taken up arms on behalf of Ukraine. Some only stay for a few weeks or months. They fight side by side with the Ukrainians, but international fighters can leave and go home if they want to. That makes a difference, says Caleb List. When you go to a Ukrainian unit, you notice like the whole place is clean. Um, they, have, uh, they have people who cook and just set up and it's nice. So like when you come off mission, it's, 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 the place is nice, it's spotless. Um, with the Legion, because they're new and people, like, you know, new people, they, and because people leave and come back, they, they remake a lot of the mistakes, so the places sometimes are dirty, it's not as well organised, they'll leave stuff behind. Caleb List is from Australia. He had no military experience when he joined up a year ago, but is now a platoon commander. He says he was about to join the French Foreign Legion when Russia invaded Ukraine, so he changed plans. Adventure, he says, was part of his motivation. I wanted to test myself. I wanted to, like, again, I wanted to join the French Foreign Legion. I wanted to push myself to the extreme. So I came here with the same motivation and uh, I've basically done that. And now I just, uh, I just do this because that's the only thing I'm really good at. Here, away from the front, things are a bit more relaxed. The Legion has been fighting under Ukrainian command in the Kharkiv Offensive and towards Bakhmut. Although Hobbit has his own, only half-joking description of their most important contribution to the war. <laughs> to die or get wounded every couple of months, so the West uh, keeps having Ukraine in the headlines and giving support. I mean, we, we don't intend to, to do it, but I think in the end, it, it turns out to be the, how do you say, biggest impact we can have. Assuming they don't make that kind of impact, all three men say they have no plans to return to normal civilian life. I'm now joined by Frank Ledwich. He is a senior lecturer in strategic studies at Portsmouth University and a former UK military intelligence officer. Welcome to DW. Um, as we've just seen, these volunteers have different motivations, um, at different levels of experience, but how effective are they on the battlefield? Well, good morning, Chrissy. The very astute young Finnish soldier there at the end outlined the main 
impact they have. It's to keep it's to keep a stake, essentially uh, a blood stake, let's say, in the war uh, for Western countries at that strategic level. I and mean, the very fact that you have that report is witness to that. At the tactical level, which is to say at the battlefield level, it's highly variable. Some units are kept back to do second line work because they're not necessarily capable for the for the really hard end stuff and they t t take too many casualties. Other units are very effective. There aren't that many overall, there's just a few thousand, so they don't make any, any, any great difference. But I think the main impact is that strategic level, it's to keep a stake, a, a, a stake in, the, in the battle. In, in, in Russia, um, the war is portrayed as a struggle against NATO. Uh, at least you see loads of that on Russian state television. And Russia uses captured foreigners to drive this, this, this narrative home. Um, does the presence of these volunteers on, a front, on the front line pose a, a danger to NATO potentially? No, I don't, I don't think so. This is a purely rhetorical uh, rhetorical effort by Russia, and of course, generally speaking, lies. Uh, this is not like the French foreign, well, I suppose it is to some extent like the French foreign legion in that this is a unit composed entirely of foreigners. And these foreigners, though, are like the foreign legion fighting for Ukraine. They're not fighting for Finland or Germany or UK or US or Canada or Georgia, for that matter. Georgia has a very strong strong contribution to this to this effort, by the way. They're fighting for Ukraine. Everyone knows that, including Russia. There's no NATO involvement in this at all. In fact, I've not even heard any rumours of any NATO involvement. Uh, it's, simply, uh, it's simply propaganda. Volunteers uh, returning from this war, they'll, they'll deal with the same challenges that professional soldiers face when they come home from campaign. Um, but without the official support network, so how difficult will it be for them? Very difficult, Chrissy. I have many friends who are seriously injured in the Iraq or Afghan fiascos. They have had largely superb care from our country. These are people who have severe mental conditions or completely incapacitating disabilities. And of course, these legionnaires are prone to even more of that, I suspect, since the combat is far more intense than it ever was for us. So in the event they're injured or killed, and we don't hear about that, the kind of care they're going to get in Ukraine, by virtue of the fact, not so much of their nationality, but the, the sheer numbers of injured involved, will be far inferior to the kind of care they get in the UK, in the US, Germany and other such places. And that certainly, for me, if I were a young man, would be a real, a real uh, disincentive. And it should be something that people think about before they go there. Uh, they, and furthermore, of course, they'll get no thanks from their home countries, in, 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 which isn't necessarily the case, really, uh, in ours. So it's a very different situation for them. And I don't think, frankly, in the mm. longer term, uh, they'll get much in the way of thanks from Ukraine in that respect. Mm. All right. That is Frank Ledridge today from the University of Portsmouth. As always, appreciate it, Frank. Thank you very much. Let's go now to Daniel Byman. He's a professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He's also author of the book Road Warriors, Foreign Fighters in the Armies of Jihad. He joins us tonight from Washington. It's good to have you with us. You've written of foreign fighters that, and I'm quoting here, most end up as cannon fodder. I, I assume they don't go into the fighting thinking that that's going to happen to them. How can so many be so wrong? So when we think about people who are going to fight, uh, of course, they understandably often see themselves as heroes. And the people you profiled are uh, good examples where some come in with considerable military experience and some come in with none whatsoever. And many of those who are there who have no experience, who only fight for a short time, uh, in past conflicts, they're often thrust into the breach and as a result, end up dying in large numbers. What we've seen now in Ukraine, though, is quite different, where people have often been there for months or even over a year. And those who remain are really, in a almost Darwinian sense, are skilled fighters where they have a lot of experience and are able to fight quite effectively. So the initial mm -hmm. rush of volunteers often uh, involves a lot of casualties, but subsequent uh, fighters tend to be more experienced and skilled. Yeah, I mean, the, the story we just saw, you know, you get the impression that many are, are maybe lost souls 
when they do actually go to battle, you have cautioned against the reliance on foreign fighters. Why? Foreign fighters often come with a lot of motivations that don't have much to do with the day-to-day -day struggle for, in this case, the Ukrainians or others involved. Uh, sometimes they're there for adventure, and when the fighting dies down, they, they still want to fight. Uh, sometimes their own views are more extreme than those of local fighters, and as a result, they'll do atrocities or otherwise be more violent. Uh, the key is really integrating them in a disciplined way into the armed forces of the country, and the Ukrainians have done that with a considerable degree of success. So some of the worst predictions people had about foreign fighters at the onset of the war have not come true. There, we know that there are Russian citizens in the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. I mean, what do we know about these people? So this is often referred to as the uh, Russian Volunteer Group. And some of the Russians fighting there are, uh, if you will, they see themselves as dissidents from the Russian system, but some have uh, far-right tendencies, some are white supremacists or neo-Nazis. It's a, it's a mix of individuals, and many of these people have actually been quite effective in doing cross-border operations into Russia itself for obvious reasons. They can blend in very effectively. Uh, but at the same time, there is a tarnishing of Ukraine's cause. These ideologies of at least some of these people are quite extreme, and it lends credence to the Russia propaganda that the Ukrainian government is controlled by Nazis. And even though that's patently false, even having a few of these individuals in high-profile operations uh, contributes to that misperception. Professor Daniel Byman with the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Professor, we appreciate your time and your analysis tonight. Thank you. And for more on the international unit, uh, I spoke to Jean-Francois Rattel. He's a professor of conflict studies at the University of Ottawa. The fighters are probably coming from roughly 30 or 40 countries, um, a lot from Russia itself, uh, but also from other republics uh, of former Soviet Union, like Georgia, uh, Belarus, as well as Western countries. Uh, we're talking about several thousand people. It's difficult to assess an exact number. Uh, numbers were inflated early in the war, uh, but we know that certain units certainly uh, can uh, put on the field at least 1,000 or 1,500 combatants on a regular basis. So the numbers are not small. Hmm. Now, are these international fighters incorporated fully in the, into Ukraine's armed forces, and are they paid? How does it work? Most of them are incorporated, at least in a way or another, with the Ukrainian army. Um, they are usually not paid. They are volunteers coming from abroad. Uh, being paid would make them mercenaries with a different status under international law. Um, the, but they usually organize along a uh, linguistic or nationalist uh, unit um, because they can uh, be used more efficiently like that. But Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian military intelligence have also been using some of those units behind enemy lines in Ukraine and in Russia. Mm. Now, uh, there are Russian citizens in the Ukrainian International Legion. What do we know about them and also about their motivation? Yes, different type, different motivation. Uh, early on, since 2014-15, you have two units of far-right Russians uh, that are opposed to the current regime in Russia. Uh, they have been conducting strike within Russian territory in Bryansk and Belgorod. Uh, but you have also all kind of Russian citizens from across Russia, uh, in the Caucasus and Siberia, ethnic Russian, uniting with a common goal to fight against Russia and also to seek to topple the Russian regime and establish a more uh, Western-based regime uh, for the future. Let me change the subject briefly. As we've heard earlier in the program, the Ukraine is now in possession of 31 Abrams tanks, promised around six months ago. What difference will they make? 
It will certainly make a tactical advantage for Ukraine, especially in a southern front. At the same time, uh, heavy armor have not been as used has not been used as much as we're expecting in the south. And most likely it is infantry-based combat. And with the weather being more difficult starting in October and November, um, those Abrams won't play as big as a role as if they would have arrived in the summer, for example. But certainly they offer a non-negligible uh, option for uh, Ukrainian forces to move Russian forces out of Ukraine. Jean-François Rattel there, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us.